muted. Um, estimating the burden of disease of intimate partner violence um, in 2011. We've now got quite a few of the participants on board, so we think we'll get underway. Um, we have allocated one and a half hours for this webinar, but may finish earlier. So my name is Linnell Moon. Um, I also have Miriam Lum on and Michelle Gooley here with me today. And we're going to split up the presentation um, to, to make it a bit more interesting, hopefully, for you. Um, at the end of, so there's four sections that we'll, we'll use in this presentation. And at the end of each section, we'll break to see if anybody has any questions about that particular part of the presentation. Um, note that your questions can be typed in and, and we can see them as you go, so feel free to add any questions as we're going through. Um, we'd probably prefer to have questions typed in um, to this forum, so we have muted attendees as they, as, as they have logged in. But if we need to, we are able to change that. So if there is something that needs to be explained rather than typed, we can do that as well. And just lastly, to let you know that the webinar will be recorded um, and it's expected to be posted on the ANROSE website for future reference. So here's the outline of the webinar. Um, so the, sec the first section is background to the project and I'll run through that um, in just a moment. Then section two is on the methodology, so the definitions, um, particularly a, an overview of the comparative risk assessment technique, um, and Miriam will run through that. Then Michelle will give you an overview of some of the key results from the study. And then lastly, I'll finish up um, going through some of the strengths and limitations of this approach um, and data gaps and opportunities. Okay, so firstly into the background. So as you all know, exposure to intimate partner violence has serious health outcomes for Australian women and their children, and its prevention is a recognised national priority. Now the overall aim of the project that we're talking about today is to determine and quantify the health impacts from intimate partner violence. The project really had two parts. The first part was to systematically review the evidence on exposure to IPV and the associated health impacts um, for Australian women, and uh, most importantly in relation to burden of disease analysis. Now this systematic um, literature re review was published earlier this year um, in our State of Knowledge report, which is available from ANRO's website. And then the second part of the project was to extend the results reported in our larger Australian Burden of Disease study um, to produce estimates of the burden for IPV for Australian women um, and also to provide more documentation of the methods and inputs used. Um, it's an important point here is that burden of disease analysis is arguably the best way to determine the health impact of intimate partner violence is it not only in, um, identifies the health outcomes with strong links to partner violence, but it also quantifies the relationship between partner violence and the various health outcomes. And then also it does this in a comparable way, both across diseases and across risk factors, so that you can make valid comparisons with other risk factors such as smoking and obesity. So the um, AHW recently completed a large project which um, to determine to, to estimate the population health impact of diseases and injuries as well as various risk factors. Now this analysis is called burden of disease and the recent study was called the Australian Burden of Disease Study and that's the acronym up there on the slide, ABDS. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. But this ANROSE funded project that we're mostly talking about today extends the work of the ABDS to determine what to determine what proportion of the burden is due to partner violence. So firstly for some background on the ABDS, this project was funded by the Department of Health um, and the former Australian National Prevention Ag Agency. It provides estimates for 2011, which is a, a new 
reference year, as well as um, revised the older estimates for 2003, so previously published results so that we're using comparable methods for both 2011 and 2003. The ABDS had two components, the national estimates and also estimates for Indigenous people and that included measures of the gap between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians. It also has sub-national estimates where valid and that included state and territory estimates, estimates by remoteness and socioeconomic group. Um, very importantly, the, the the work was supported by an expert advisory committee, a group, sorry, an Indigenous reference group, but also disease specific expert panels uh, who provided a lot of detailed advice on some of the specific methods and lastly a jurisdictional working group. And the work was undertaken in consultation with some key international groups who are working in burden of disease including the Global Burden of Disease Study, the WHO and New Zealand. So what is burden of disease? Well, it is a technique used to compare the impact of different diseases, conditions or injuries and risk factors on a population. Um, it has two main parts, the first quantifying the impact of diseases and injuries and the second quantifying the role various risk factors play in this burden. So the first part, which is the, the disease side, combines multiple data sources to count and compare the fatal and non-fatal health impact from virtually all diseases and injuries in a population. And, and this burden is measured using disability adjusted life years, which I'll talk a bit more about in a moment. So the AHW undertook this work as part of the ABDS and with the results published earlier this year. And in that study, we had estimates for around 200 diseases. And then the second part, which is the risk factor side, measures the attributable burden due to a range of risk factors. So this is the reduction in burden that would have occurred if exposure to the risk factor had been avoided. In other words, the disease burden due to the risk factor. And we were able to include 29 risk factors in the national study published earlier this year, including intimate partner violence. So this project we've now undertaken with ANROSE extends the intimate partner violence analysis from the national project um, and we'll provide more details about that this morning. There's um, important characteristics of burden of disease analysis is its comparability across two main dimensions. It combines both the fatal and non-fatal impacts of disease in a comparable way and it also measures the impact of all diseases and injuries in a comparable way. So that's a really, those, those um, characteristics are really important to remember. Okay, so the next slide um, shows the components of burden of disease analysis. Uh, it's quite a complicated slide, but I just wanted to provide, give this, to show this to you so you can see how each bit relates to each other and the various inputs that are needed in burden of disease analysis. So I talked a moment ago about the two parts of burden of disease analysis, the disease burden side and on this slide that is the three boxes on the left hand side of the slide. And then I talked about the second part of burden of disease analysis and uh, which is the risk factor side and that's the green part of this slide on the right hand side. Um, so if I just quickly run through the various components, in terms of the burden side, the first part of the burden that we, we measure is the fatal burden and that's measured in what's called years of life lost um, or YLL and that takes in the inputs for that part of the analysis is the number of deaths from each disease um, and also the age at death and that, so that then we can calculate the years lost from premature death. The second part is the non-fatal burden and, and that's measured using years lived with disability or YLD. Uh, and the inputs for that part of the analysis are the number of cases for a particular disease or the prevalence along with the duration of that particular disease and the severity of that disease. And from those three inputs we can then calculate the years lived in less than 
full health or YLD. And then the last, well, we can we can then add the fatal and non-fatal burden together, so the YLL plus YLD, to get the total burden of disease, and that's measured using the Disability Adjusted Life Year or DALI. And then the the part that's of particular interest today is the attributable burden side on the on the right hand side of the of the um, graph there. So this quantifies the proportion of burden due to various risk factors. Um, and it does that by using the latest evidence on the links between the risk factors and the particular diseases. And that's when we get the, the term the linked diseases. Um, and then the linked diseases can be either in relation to the fatal burden, the YLL, or the non-fatal burden, the YL, YLDs. So once we have those linked diseases, we then take the exposure from the various risk factors or the prevalence um, for the various risk factors, along with um, the size of the effect of the risk factor on the disease or the relative risk in this diagram. From that, we can calculate the population attributable fraction or the PAF, um, and from that, we then can calculate the attributable burden which is down the bottom of that slide there. So Miriam's going to talk a little bit more about this as well. So this is just to give you an, uh, an overview of the methods used. This slide then gives you the definitions from some of, for some of the terms that I just used. Um, I won't go through those. They'll be there um, in the slides if you want to go back later for reference. But it's just the, the specific definitions for some of those terms. Okay, so now I'm going to show you just a couple of slides which give you a flavour of the results from the ABDS. So at the moment we're still concentrating on the overall uh, national burn of disease study that was published by AIHW earlier this year, and we haven't yet moved to the specifics about intimate partner violence. So this figure shows you the leading disease groups causing burden in Australia in 2011. Um, so the total burden measured in DALUs is up the top followed by non-fatal burden and fatal burden below it. So you can see that the four leading disease groups that contribute, contributed the most burden of disease uh, were chronic diseases. So cancer, cardiovascular disease, uh, mental health problems and musculoskeletal disorders. And together these accounted for 58% of disease burden. And this was followed by injuries that accounted for a further 9% and then, then respiratory diseases at 7%. You can also see from looking at the bottom two parts of this figure that um, the burden due to mental uh, health disorders and musculoskeletal conditions is largely non-fatal, while the burden from cancer and cardiovascular disease is largely fatal. So that's um, a, an example of the results from the, the disease burden side. So now I'll just show you some results from the risk factor side of the, of the analysis. So this slide shows you the um, top five risk fact ranked risk factors by age groups for Australian women in 2011. And we've put the women up here because that's what we'll be talking about for most of this webinar. Um, and you can see that the ranking of these risk factors varies by age group, um, with alcohol use being the top risk factors in the younger age groups, then it becomes tobacco, and then uh, lastly, blood pressure. Um, of interest today is the partner violence um, risk factor. So in the overall national ABDS study, uh, partner violence was ranked third for the two youngest age groups that we have on that slide. So now that's, that's basically the overview of the um, ABDS, the overarching national study. So as, as I said earlier, we then extended these results um, in the project funded by Anne Rose. And so we'll be talking mostly about the ANROSE work from now on in this presentation. So I'll just run you through some of the previous studies that have measured intimate partner violence um, burden. So it was included as a risk factor um, in previous, well, both previous global and Australian burden of disease analyses. The first study to look at the health burden of intimate partner violence was conducted by the Victorian Government in 2004 using 2001 data. Uh, following this, national estimates were published 
in the 2003 Australian Burden of Disease Study and then more recently the Global Burden of Disease Study has undertaken an international level analysis for 2010, 2013 and 2015. Um, and then as I said earlier, in we at the AHW we updated the 2003 estimates recently um, in the AVDS study. Uh, just a quick note on, I should have said it earlier, but the, the AVDS 2011, uh, you might wonder why we use 2011 as the latest data and it sounds a little bit old and it was largely because that was the latest common year of data available across the main data sources when we needed to undertake the analysis. But we have set up the system so that hopefully we can provide updated data fairly quickly in the future. Okay, so this slide um, just shows you, it's really just to illustrate some of the variation and overlap um, in, in the linked diseases that are used in various studies. So you don't really need to worry too much about the detail as it's in our reports that, are, that have been published, but um, you can see that there is variation. So different linked diseases are used in some of these different studies that we have up here on this table. And so this means that, that, that you can't compare directly between these studies. So that's the key message here. That, and it's largely due to uh, some differing methods that are used, and we'll talk a bit more about that in a moment, but also um, changes in the available evidence in the literature which guides these burden of disease studies. So this slide then outlines some of the key changes in methods between those studies. So since the uh, Vic Health 2004 study, there's been a range of methodological developments in burden of disease studies globally. And the most significant of these um, occurred in the Global Burden of Disease Study in 2010. So the recent ABDS, the Australian study, adopted many of these key changes. Um, and again, that's meant reinforcing the message that you can't compare between these studies. Um, and I think it's also fair to say that the requirement for causal evidence has become stricter in the more recent burden of disease studies. Um, some of the main, some of the other things that have changed uh, between studies is the, even between the recent ABDS 2011 and the ANROS um, project are important to note. Firstly, in terms of different scope. Um, so in the ANROS funded work, we've been able to do some more in-depth analysis and so have been able to include non-cohabiting relationships such as boyfriend, girlfriend um, and date relationships in our, in our analysis and also emotional abuse for uh, cohabiting partners. We were also able to take more comp to, to do much more comprehensive review of the literature um, and so have been able to add extra linked diseases and these were anxiety disorders, alcohol use disorders and preterm and load both weight complications. There are also some different effect sizes um, that come from that updated literature review um, and we can talk a bit more about those in a moment. And lastly, just to let you know that we um, were able to include direct estimates uh, for some of the relationships between the risk factor and the diseases. So these direct estimates um, give us actual data for, for the relationships such as non-fatal homicide and violence um, which came from the hospital's data. So that's largely the background and, and broad introduction to the methods and, and previous studies. Um, we can just pause here in case anybody has any questions at this stage. If you did have any questions, you can type into your chat box uh, and we will be able to see those and respond um, verbally or, or, or via the chat as well. No one's typing. 
Well, it's um, Miriam Lamon speaking now. Um, Lanelle's handed over the microphone to me. Uh, and the second section uh, of the webinar today is to go into a little bit more detail around the methods that we used. Um, if in the meantime you are thinking through what Lanelle has just um, covered in the, the background section, feel free to type as we, as we go through this second section as well because we can always stop and address those. Okay, just before I go into the detail around uh, the methods, uh, I thought we'd put up a slide just to cover some of the key terms used. Uh, and a lot of these refer back to the detailed slide Lanelle showed at the beginning um, where there was the green box where we talk about how we calculate the attributable burden. Uh, and some of the key terms in this section are the population attributable fraction and this is uh, a percentage reduction in burden that would have occurred if exposure to a risk factor was avoided and that's specific for a particular risk factor and a, and a causally linked disease. An effect size, we often also refer to this as an, an estimate of effect and this is just a statistical measure of the strength of a relationship between two variables. So in this context, in our study, we were looking at um, the, the risk of exposure to intimate partner violence and a number of different disease outcomes, which we'll go through in a sec. Uh, I won't explain what the relative risk is explicitly, but it's just an example of a, an effect size or an estimate of effect. And just to um, cover another key uh, epidemiological term, which is prevalence, which is the number of people uh, with a disease or a risk factor in a population at a point in time. So, the next uh, slide is just um, an overview of the, the methodology that we've actually used to calculate the attributable burden in both the Australian Burden Disease Study and also this ANROS um, research project. And it's a methodological framework which is um, originally sourced from the World Health Organisation, uh, which is called Comparative Risk uh, Assessment. And it's the process for estimating the burden of disease attributable um, to selected risk factors. And it's got five key steps. I'm going to be covering one, two, and three in, in detail in this section of the webinar. Um, but I will um, just briefly mention four and five uh, now. So, uh, steps one is around the selection of uh, disease outcomes or linked diseases, and that is based on the evidence of a causal association or relationship. The second step, which is to estimate the population uh, level distribution of exposure. Uh, and then the third step is to uh, estimate or select the effect sizes or estimates of effect that um, you will, will apply. Uh, step four uh, is to define the theoretical minimum risk exposure level. And in, in this case or in this project, um, that's a minimum, uh, the minimum is zero or no exposure to intimate partner violence. And then lastly, step five is to calculate the population attributable fraction, which is where we bring everything together, where we estimate the proportion of burden that would have been avoided if, that, if the population had never um, been exposed to the risk factor. Uh, so I won't, I won't go back to those steps four and five that we're about to move into how we determined uh, our selection of disease outcomes. So this work was actually undertaken in, in the first report that we published in this uh, research project, which was the landscape uh, report published by ANROS in March 2016. Uh, and in, in this report, uh, it's a, a systematic literature review where we uh, went through all of the uh, evidence that we could find uh, relating to uh, intimate partner violence, exposure to intimate partner violence that were explicitly applicable to Australian women in 2011. And from this report we found that there was strong evidence or convincing evidence of a causal um, relationship between IPV and depressive disorders, early pregnancy loss, 
uh, and homicide and violence, and they are classed as injuries. Uh, uh, probable evidence of a, a causal effect of IPV on anxiety disorders, suicide and self-inflicted and suicide and self-inflicted injuries, and possible evidence of a of a causal effect on IPV for alcohol use disorders and uh, children born prematurely or with a low birth rate. And to class these, we actually applied levels of evidence um, from a framework used in the Global Burden of Disease Studies. Okay, the second step uh, in comparative risk uh, assessment is to identify your exposure data source. And in this case, we used uh, the Australian Bureau of Statistics Personal Safety Survey, uh, which relates to the reference year of 2012. The PSS is an, a nationally representative, you know, high quality study with about uh, just over 17,000 participants uh, reporting on Australian women aged 18 years and above, but looking at their lifetime exposure from the age of 15. Uh, I've put on the slide um, uh, some of the data sources that we could actually obtain from this survey. So there were two prevalence estimates that we, we were able to derive primarily, the first being physical and sexual IPV, uh, firstly for cohabiting partners only, and that was actually the definition that we used in the, the, the broader Australian Burden of Disease Study in 2011. But also, we were able to obtain uh, the prevalence for physical and sexual IPV for both cohabiting and non-cohabiting partners uh, from, this, from this survey. Uh, and I just thought we'd note that the Personal Safety Survey didn't collect data on emotional abuse um, perpetrated by a non-cohabiting partner, but it did uh, for the first time collect information on cohabiting or emotional abuse in cohabiting relationships. So this was one of the um, things that we could add in uniquely into this research uh, project. Sorry. Just some, some definitions as well. Uh, so for this research project, intimate partner violence refers to physical and sexual violence and emotional abuse by a current or previously cohabiting or non-cohabiting partner. And that term partner um, refers to or describes a person where the respondent either currently lives with or lived with at some point in a married or a de facto relationship. Cohabiting IPV refers collectively to um, physical and sexual violence and emotional abuse by a current or previously cohabiting partner. So that's a slightly more um, uh, uh, limited definition. Um, and just to go into the actual type of IPV, physical and sexual IPV explicitly excludes emotional abuse, and, um, but it can include both the cohabiting um, Oh, sorry, include the cohabiting relationships or non-cohabiting relationships, and when or previously cohabiting a partner. And just a note um, on some of the definitional overlaps. There are many overlaps between these definitions as they relate to both um, cohabitation or non-cohabitation, um, the physical and sexual um, violence itself and or exposure to emotional abuse. So just as a note there for emotional abuse, we know that the lifetime exposure um, to emotional abuse for a cohabiting partner is about 24.5% um, of the female population, but what we don't know is the lifetime exposure to emotional abuse by both cohabiting and non-cohabiting partners because this wasn't collected in the, the personal safety survey. Uh, however, this is um, highlights you know, a key opportunity um, for improvement um, of this data gap in future uh, surveys. Is everyone, can everyone hear me okay? I think I've just got a note from Peter saying 
have I gone very soft? You can reply by text, um, by chat. If <laughs> I'm assuming it's okay. So we were able to um, derive these um, this prevalence of exposure from the personal safety survey for the national population. However, um, we also really wanted to be able to um, uh, apply this methodology to the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander population um, uh, for women in Australia. Um, so to do this, um, we had to use sort of less than ideal. Um, methods to um, derive that prevalence of exposure. So I just wanted to say that caution is required in, in interpretation of this, um, largely because um, the personal safety survey did not collect um, prevalence of intimate partner violence exposure in um, for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women. Um, and so what we did was um, uh, look at a number of different other data sources and options that we could derive a, a proxy uh, method um, to derive an, an indigenous to total population rate ratio that we could apply to the national prevalence rate. And in this case we used um, a, a rate ratio of 2.5 and that was based on a standardised rates of 12 months female prevalence of physical or threatened violence. Uh, victimisation from two um, surveys, both um, ABS surveys, the 2006 General Social Survey um, for national estimates and then for the 2008 National Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Social Survey for the Indigenous estimates, um, which is where we obtained that rate ratio. Unfortunately, no data sources were identified to um, be able to estimate Indigenous exposure for emotional abuse. Uh, it's also just a note to say that that rate ratio we then had to assume applied to sexual violence, so to, com to combine the exposure to physical and sexual IPV. Um, however, the actual data that it was based on really only related to the physical violence. So these are some known limitations of um, the method that we've applied here. Um, we also looked at um, some more recent data from the National Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Social Survey for 2014-15. However, the rate ratios that we derived um, from that uh, preliminary analysis were, were even higher than the 2.5 that we derived there and so those were deemed by uh, our Indigenous health experts as implausible. So, after we've identified which of um, the linked diseases um, that we can apply in this analysis and we also then identified um, the prevalence of exposure, we then have to look at the um, relationship between that exposure and the, the linked disease outcome, which is where we um, select our estimates of effect or effect sizes. And, and a number of factors go into that decision um, and they largely go back to the studies that we identified through the Landscapes State of Knowledge Report um, where we looked at a number of different um, uh, uh, studies in the literature and we look at them based on their recency. Um, so in this case we wanted to see data from the year 2001 onwards and their relevance um, to, the, to Australian women. So we were restricting um, studies to high income countries only. We looked at the sample size, um, so in this case we were looking for uh, a sample size greater than 500 and where a study controlled for confounding uh, variables. Uh, we also looked into the types of measurement um, for how they actually um, defined intimate partner violence exposure and also how they defined the disease, the linked disease outcome, uh, as those things also have likely impacts on the size of the effect. And then, of course, this is not always that straightforward. So other key considerations that um, we had to make um, when often there were more than one study that um, uh, 
had an appropriate um, effect size where we were just looking at um, to maintain logical consistency in our decision making across the linked diseases. Uh, I should also um, note that uh, through the global burden of disease studies and also through um, quite a lot of work that the World Health Organization has done in this space, uh, quite, a, quite a few um, meta-analyses uh, have been undertaken um, that derive, that um, really pull those estimates of effect across a number of global um, studies and derive a, an estimate um, and in those cases uh, they, they may or may not have been the most appropriate um, effect size to, to uh, utilise. Um, and also just if the confidence intervals of an effect size were overlapping um, with those used by in the global burden of disease. So the, in those cases we use the global burden of disease uh, effect size. So just to <laughs> put this um, a lot of complex information on the screen, um, don't worry about too much about the detail, but all, all of this is in our report. Uh, this is just a list of all of the disease or linked disease outcomes that we were able to include, the effect size type that we selected. Um, so in, on this screen, R, R stands for a relative risk. The one that's really important to look at is effect size and that's highlighted in red. And that's that statistical measure of the strength of the relationship between two variables. So in this context between the risk of um, ITZ and a disease outcome. So the higher the number, the more likely that the disease outcome is caused by exposure to the risk factor. Uh, and also on this slide you can just see that the um, what actual study, what was the source or the source of uh, where we actually attained that effect size. And uh, just I will explain the, how we've used those proportions that are listed under homicide and violence in the next few slides. Okay, so I'm just going to cover two of our linked diseases um, at this stage. The first one being for depressive disorders, uh, mainly because we don't have time to go into all of them, but you can certainly read about it in our uh, the, the detailed horizons report. So for depressive disorders, the, the literature review or state of knowledge report found um, 16 uh, studies that provided evidence on the link between intimate partner violence and depression um, that, that were applicable um, to Australian women. And they, they all provided strong evidence um, with large sample sizes and they were derived from high income countries. However, they all did differ in, in several ways, such as how they measured depression, um, whether they were a, a, a clinical diagnostic um, DSM-4 related definition um, or whether it was experience of, of, whether it was a full depressive disorder versus just experience of um, depression. They had differing sample sizes, age and other covariates. Um, but overall, most of these studies found that IPV did uh, increase the risk of subsequent depressive disorders. So this figure itself is a forest plot. Uh, so it lists the studies um, on the left-hand side, and they're the, they're the ones that we considered had, had a strong level of evidence. And these all controlled for a range of socio-demographic factors such as age and race, uh, marital status, income and education. Uh, and so the lower red box I've highlighted there or on the screen is actually the, the effect size that we chose, which is from the Global Burden of Disease 2010, which was also applied in 2013. Uh, and that was um, as published in a, in a global meta-analysis and by in, in a study called They Do Net L 2012. And that shows clear overlaps with the results from all of the other studies, which is what you can see in that forest plot. Um, so the actual relative risk we applied was 1.89. Um, however, we also in this study were able to include um, emotional abuse for the first time. And the, the literature um, supported um, depressive disorders to also be linked to emotional abuse. And so in this case, we differed slightly. 
and um, we identified three different studies um, that were ex explicitly provided a strong um, level of evidence around exposure to um, emotional or psychological abuse only and then subsequent um, depressive disorder. And for this we used um, COCA uh, at our 2012 and, and that's the one I've just highlighted up on the screen to say that's what we applied for emotional abuse only uh, related to depressive disorders. Now the second um, brief case study is just a great example of where we've been able to use direct evidence from um, for Australian women um, for and applied it for um, separately to both those fatal and non-fatal um, burden outcomes. So if you remember when Lonnell was speaking earlier, um, the fatal referred to the, the YLs or years of life lost due to uh, premature death uh, and the non-fatal burden. And in this case we've had to or we've been fortunate in Australia to be able to apply this direct evidence from different data sources as they apply to those two different outcomes between death and non um, living with a disease. So for fatal burden we use data from the National Homicide Monitoring Program. So in 2000 or as an, an average between 2010 and 12, 46 percent of female homicides in Australia were perpetrated by an intimate partner. Um, and for non-fatal burden we've used data from the National Hospital Morbidity Database uh, which uh, showed us that 41% of hospitalised assaults on women were perpetrated by an intimate partner. Now it's just a, a good to note that those assaults could have been an, a range of different injuries uh, uh, um, from you know uh, fractures through to um, uh, more uh, long-term injuries I suppose. Uh, a really interesting note is there that both of these data sources didn't distinguish between whether that intimate partner was cohabiting or non-cohabiting. So in this case we decided to assume that both of those data sources were, could be applied to the, non -co uh, to the cohabiting uh, definition. Uh, and it's also important to note that for the data we extracted from the National Hospital for Morbidity Database is that many injuries due to assault aren't admitted to hospital and um, they might be treated at home um, or never seek treatment at all or through an emergency department and that also a high proportion of those hospitalizations for assault do not have the perpetra perpetrator type recorded. So this, this, some of these things are limitations um, to, to that data. So what this is an example of a, a direct, some direct evidence that we're able to apply. Um, so in place of a uh, population attributable fraction we've been able to use those straight uh, and link it straight to the disease um, prevalence that we've obtained through the Australian Burn Disease Study. So I've got some questions <laughs> which is great. I've actually got a couple. Uh, so I might go with the second one that if everyone can see the chat, um, Peter Cox has asked, um, does hospitalised mean that they were admitted or might they have just gone to emergency, the emergency department and uh, so so no, um, hospitalised means that they were at, at yeah, a full admission and uh, separation and so that they have the, the full medical record to, um, to, to be able to assign that that diagnosis and to say that, that that assault was definitely perpetrated by an intimate partner. Um, emergency department data is harder to um, or we weren't able to utilise uh, in this space. Um, however, the actual disease outcomes, the actual assaults um, did um, have emergency department presentations taken into account uh, in those. So while we, the actual, the um, proportion, the direct evidence, that 41% didn't include um, emergency department presentations, the actual disease linked disease outcome did. I hope Peter that makes any sense to you. <laughs> uh, and then the other question I can see is how is violence a causal effect 
of intimate partner violence. I think that refers to the actual link, a definition of the linked diseases. Uh, and in this case, uh, in this same example, um, it's the, it's, I should have said, um, it's the homicide, which is the death outcome, and violence, which is assaults or uh, assault or violent related injuries that um, we're, we're referring to here. So they're not a causal effect, it's the linked disease. Again, I hope I answered that question. <laughs> So were there any other further questions around sort of some of the more detailed uh, details of the methods? Feel free to hold, hold them up. We've got plenty of time later on uh, if you wanted to type, type a question in later that referred to the methods. And I'll hand over to Michelle Gooley. Hi everyone, so my name is Michelle Gawley and I'll be taking you through section three of this webinar which is going to provide a quick summary of the key results from the study. Uh, so note that all the results presented in this section are found in the Horizons report published by Anne Rose which focuses on women aged 18 years and over. Um, this differs slightly to the COMPASS report also published which had a focus on the 18 to 44 year age group specifically. So overall, physical sexual intimate partner violence by a current or previous cohabiting partner contributed to 1.4% of the disease burden experienced by adult Australian women in 2011. When the burden from emotional abuse was added to this, this figure rose to 1.6%. And you can see these figures in the top half of the table on the slide there. When we use the broader definition of intimate partner violence to include also non-cohabiting relationships, we found that an estimated 2% of the burden experienced by women aged 18 years and over was attributable to physical or sexual IPV. So this represents an increase of around 11,500 DALI or an additional 44% compared to the burden due to cohabiting partners alone. However, please note that the proportions here are not purely additive due to overlaps between women experiencing intimate partner violence from both cohabiting and non-cohabiting partners. When we added emotional abuse to this broader definition, it was estimated that 2.2% of all burden experienced by adult women was due to intimate partner violence in 2011. So this next slide uh, gives an indication of the proportion of burden attributed, attributable to physical sexual IPV by the various linked diseases. So of the nearly 26 1,500 DALI due to physical sexual IPV by a cohabiting partner, we can see that anxiety disorders made up the greatest proportion of this burden at 35%, followed by depressive disorders at 32% and suicide and self-inflicted injuries at 19%. Then when we looked at the cohabiting, non-cohabiting data, of the nearly 38,000 DALI due to physical sexual IPV, the same three mental health disorders were also the biggest contributors to this burden. And together they represented around 90% of the total burden due to IPV. We can also see here that homicide and violence accounted for around 10% of the IPV burden by a cohabiting partner and 7% by a cohabiting or non-cohabiting partner. Some of the factors that contribute to the distribution of diseases that are attributable to IPV include things like the duration of the disease, um, so whether the condition has a long-term impact on a women's life, the number of people affected or the prevalence of the disease, and also the size of the disease burden. So this next slide shows you the distribution of burden across the life course for the various linked diseases. So overall in 2011, burden attributable to, to physical sexual cohabiting IPV was highest between ages 40 and 44 years. However, 32% of the burden was experienced by women aged under 35. 
depressive disorders made up a greater proportion of the physical or sexual IPV burden in older women, more than half of the burden in women aged 65 years and over. For younger women, so those aged 18 to 44 years, a greater proportion of the burden attributable to IPV was associated with homicide and violence and suicide and self-inflicted injuries. This is quite different to women aged 65 and over where the associated burden was much smaller for both homicide and violence and suicide and self-inflicted injuries. Also note that this figure also includes the burden for those who were directly exposed to IPV during their mother's pregnancy and experienced preterm and low birth weight complications. This burden is shown for both males and females rather than limiting this to women only. And you can see this in the zero to four age group uh, which is shown in the green bar on this slide. Um, so I'll now talk about the leading risk factors uh, that contributed to burden in the adult women population across the lifespan. So we can see here that physical sexual IPV, which here is an inclusive of both cohabiting and non-cohabiting partners, was the second ranked risk factor in women aged 18 to 24 years behind alcohol use and this accounted for 4.2% of burden. For women aged 25 to 44, IPV was the leading risk factor, contributing to 4.8% of all burden among women in this age range. And in this age group, physical sexual IPV ranked more highly than the other key risk factors that you can see there, such as alcohol use, smoking, high body mass, and physical inactivity. So we can also look at the contribution of the various types of IPV to the total disease burden for each linked disease. So cohabiting physical sexual IPV was responsible for about half of the total burden due to homicide and violence among adult women in 2011. You can see that in the last bar there in this figure. Uh, both cohabiting and non-cohabiting IPV together were responsible for over one quarter of the total burden due to early pregnancy loss and suicide and self-inflicted injuries. And the combined attributable burden due to physical sexual IPV and emotional abuse by a cohabiting partner made up about 25% of the burden for depressive disorders. And of this, almost a quarter of this burden was due to emotional abuse. So if we look at the very first bar there for depressive disorders, around 5.7% of the total daily um, for depressive disorders was due to emotional abuse. Um, and as Miriam had indicated earlier, depressive disorders was the only disease that we included in the study that was found to have an association with um, emotional abuse. So I'm just going to finish my section on some slides showing results for the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander population. Um, so this slide is focused on Indigenous women aged 18 years and over. So in total it was estimated that cohabiting physical sexual IPV was responsible for 4.6% of overall burden for Indigenous women in 2011. When we use the broader definition, so cohabiting and non-cohabiting, it was estimated that IPV was responsible for 6.4% of the overall burden among Indigenous women. And as mentioned earlier, Indigenous estimates were not able to be calculated for cohabiting emotional abuse as reliable prevalence data were not available. So based on this broader definition, the rate of burden attributable to physical sexual IPV was estimated to be more than five times greater among Indigenous women than non-Indigenous women once we adjusted for the effects of the differences in age structure between the two populations. Um, and a larger proportion of the burden uh, due to IPV was actually fatal for Indigenous women compared to non-Indigenous women. This slide shows you the age standardised rates of burden for each of the linked diseases for Indigenous and non-Indigenous women as a comparison. So it shows you that the rates of burden uh, were much higher for Indigenous women than non-Indigenous women for all of the diseases we looked at, um, with the exception of early pregnancy loss, for which the difference was small, mainly due to having small numbers. 
the greatest absolute difference in the rates between the two populations was for anxiety disorders followed by depressive disorders. These two diseases together were responsible for more than half of the gap in disease burden due to IPV. When we used rate ratios which provide an indication of the relative difference in the rates of IPV between the two population groups, the rate of attributable burden for alcohol use disorders was 14 times higher and rates for homicide and violence 10 times higher for Indigenous women than non-Indigenous women. And both, both these two diseases, homicide and violence and alcohol use disorders, made up a greater proportion of the attributable burden due to IPV among Indigenous women compared to non-Indigenous women. And the final slide I'm going to show you on our key results is the leading risk factors among Indigenous women by age group. And we can see here that physical, sexual, intimate partner violence, which again is inclusive of both cohabiting and non-cohabiting partners, was the leading risk factor in Indigenous women aged both 18 to 24 and 24 to 44 years, accounting for around 11% of burden in both these age groups. So I'll stop there and I can see we've got a few questions. One is why do we need to use age standardisation when comparing Indigenous and non-Indigenous women? And that's from Peter. Good question, Peter. <laughs> so because of the different age profiles and structures of the Indigenous and non-Indigenous populations, um, with in Indigenous um, population having a lot more people in the younger age groups, and non-Indigenous population having people living, uh, living longer, so having more people in the older age groups, in order to account for differences um, in health outcomes that have an association with age, um, which is the case for many of these diseases we're looking at, we use age standardisation to take account of those differences in age to basically enable a valid comparison um, in terms of population rates between the two. So age standardisation is a, is a common um, technique that you'll see used in a lot of health statistics um, where there is an association with age. Um, so did anyone else, if there's anyone else that has any questions, um, you can quickly type them now um, or as they say, we can have some time at the end if you want to save them up. Um, yep. So I think I'll now pass over to Linnell, who will take us through the very final session of this presentation. Terrific. Okay. Thanks, Michelle. So we've just got a few slides to finish up. Um, just recapping on some of the differences between um, the methods that we've used and the approaches we've used in this study compared to some others. Um, and then also some of the strengths and limitations of this approach. Okay, so firstly, I think we've mentioned most of these as we've been going through the, the talk today. Um, but just to recap, so we've expanded the scope of the work um, in this current project. So we've been able to include uh, non-cohabiting IPV um, in terms of the physical and sexual violence part, and also for the first time. Um, emotional abuse, but that was just for the cohabiting component. We were also able to in include some um, new linked diseases. So as we said earlier, that was anxiety disorders, alcohol use disorders, um, and preterm and low birth weight complications. We did have some different um, effect sizes for some of the relationship between IPV and the linked diseases. So we had a substantially lower relative risk for suicide and self-inflicted injuries um, and a small increase in the relative risk for early pregnancy loss. Um, and lastly, as Miriam outlined, we were able to use direct estimates of effect for some parts, so for the non-fatal homicide and violence component of our analysis. So um, this slide actually, just to outline some of the difference between the differences between the results we talked about today, which is from the um, Horizons report, and also compared to the, some of the results that are in the Compass report, so the policy to practice part of this um, suite of products. 
So the COMPASS report focused on women aged 18 to 44 years only um, and that, that, was, that choice was made because they have responsibility for dependent children during those years um, and they also have health problems related to reproductive health. So it was sort of seen as a, um, a homogenous group to, to do some analysis on. Um, a fairly minor difference was that the COMPASS report didn't include the burden for preterm um, and low birth weight complications. Um, and that's because that part of the analysis includes males um, because some of the babies will be boys that are affected, um, and so whereas the COMPASS report only focused on the female burden. And this, this component is quite small so it has little impact on the, on the comparisons. And at the bottom of the slide there we have the, the figures so that you can compare them. So as we've um, mentioned today, for all women aged um, 18 and over, IPV accounted for around 2.2% of the disease burden when we used the, the expanded scope in this analysis and that was the seventh biggest risk factor. But when you look at the specific age group in the COMPASS report, so the 18 to 44 year olds, it accounted for for 5.1% of the disease burden and it was the top ranked risk factor for that age group. And just to let you know that all the data that was used in the COMPASS report is included in an appendix to the um, Horizons report. So if you want some more specific numbers there in that appendix. Okay, so now for some of the strengths of the study. And I think we've talked about some of these as well, but uh, just to recap. So the main strength of these reports is that they provide transparent, detailed estimates of the burden attributable to IPV for Australian and Indigenous Australian women. And it, the estimates are based on current best practice methods for risk factor analysis. Um, as we've mentioned earlier, the analysis is also done in a comparable way. Comparable way. So it's comparable across fatal and non-fatal impacts of IPV, so dying early compared with living with the disease. It's also comparable across the various disease outcomes. So the, for example, the impacts of depression can be compared with the impacts from early pregnancy loss. And it's also comparable across risk factors. So IPV can be compared with obesity, for example. Um, some of the other strengths of this approach, um, we, the, the input data for the prevalence of exposure to IPV comes from the ABS Personal Safety Survey, as Miriam mentioned, and that's a strong data source. It's nationally representative and a high quality survey. Um, as we mentioned, we've been able to expand the scope and in include non-cohabiting violence and emotional, emotional abuse for the first time. Um, and importantly, these studies were used to identify diseases linked to IPV which were um, as assessed for their relevance to Australian women. But of course there's always some limitations um, despite best efforts. So the, certainly the, um, one of the key limitations and data gaps is information um, on exposure to IPV among Indigenous Australians. That, that is directly comparable with information available for non-Indigenous Australians. So as we've mentioned, we had to use less than ideal methods to derive these es estimates. So we used indirect methods um, based on related measures of violence from ABS social surveys. Um, the second limitation is that for all burden of disease studies really, they're limited by data availability and the strength of evidence in the literature um, on which the inputs are based. So in particular we weren't able to include some health outcomes, for example chronic diseases such as coronary heart disease, um, largely due to gaps in longitudinal evidence. So um, we need that longitudinal perspective to be able to determine cause and effect. And I think it's fair to say too that for this analysis we used a conservative approach in the selection of the linked diseases and estimates of effect. Um, and, then, and then lastly, uh, current evidence doesn't enable us to be able to account for time since exposure. So it is possible that the effect size varies by time since exposure, but we don't yet have any um, 
uh, quantifiable or quantified evidence that we could use in this type of analysis. So then this slide lists some of the, the main data gaps related to some of the things I've just spoken about, but also some of the opportunities that, that um, also are related to that. So firstly, as we said, we don't have the prevalence of IPV exposure among Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women, and that's the key missing piece of the puzzle for the analysis in terms of Indigenous women. We also, uh, similarly, we don't have prevalence of IPV exposure for a number of vulnerable population groups, for example, women with disabilities, refugees and, and migrants. While we were able to include some data on emotional abuse, um, we don't have that information um, available for the non-cohabiting relationships. Uh, we also don't have evidence on childhood witnessing exposure to IPV um, and non-partner sexual assault. So just uh, in terms of the children witnessing IPV, um, evidence which demonstrates that causal relationship between children witnessing and health outcomes is, is problematic. And so the current evidence is, is difficult for us to use. For example, the validity of diagnosis in young children is problematic as well as definitions of around witnessing. But it's an area where um, hopefully the, this sort of work could be expanded into in the future. But, but as we said, we were able to, for the first time, include some of the burden that, um, of IPV that does impact on children by including preterm and low birth weight complications as one of the linked diseases. Okay, and the, the last slide that we have um, is really just to finish up, is to summarise some of the, the key benefits here. So the analysis that we were able to do in partnership with ANROSE provides evidence that IPV is a significant health problem for Australian women. Um, we were able to broaden the definition of IPV and uh, with the inclusion of, also with the inclusion of emotional abuse, and so that enables us to provide evidence that is useful across many sectors for both policy and planning purposes. Um, we certainly acknowledge that the estimates um, come from a, quite a complex model of IPV, but that does give us greater, a greater level of transparency um, and increased specificity <laughs> sorry, to Australian women. Um, and then the last thing is that this ANROSE funded project was largely an extension of the National Burden of Disease Study. So it was a really a great opportunity to be able to expand the um, depth of evidence that we were able to use in the burden of disease analysis in relation to IPV. So we'll certainly be able to consider the, the work from this study in any future national burden of disease studies. So that brings us to the end of our planned slides. Um, we'd be very happy if there's any uh, to take any other questions that um, people might have. As I said at the beginning, these, this presentation has been recorded, so the plan is that it'll be made available for people to, to look at from ANRO's website. Um, we can also send you, so we also have a, um, a, an e a generic email address that we can send around, so if, 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 if you don't think of any specific questions now, we'd be most happy to, for you to email any questions through later and, and we'll get back with you with the answer. Um, I can't see any extra questions at this stage. Miriam or Michelle, anything you want to add at this stage? No? Okay, so thank you everybody. We really appreciate your time that you've um, been able to sit through and, and listen through this, the presentation with us. We found this a really valuable project um, and we were really pleased to be able to undertake it with Anne Rose. So again, thank you for your time and we look forward to any questions that might come through via email later on. Thank you very much. <laughs>